look like what we're used to and that we can't make pictures of it the way we can of baseballs uh, doesn't mean that, mm. that somehow we have to give up all of our ideas about the universe. It just tells us we've got to this other realm now and the, the rules are different. If you want to play the quantum game, you've got to play by the quantum mm. rules. There are some particularly strange things about uh, quantum mechanics. I mean, quantum mechanics tells us, for example, that maybe electrons can be in two places at once. Now, that's not a problem. But well, uh, that's, ju that's, that's, that that's just a little though. bit weird. It's not what it says. On the other hand, it also we also know that when we measure an electron, it's always in one place at a time. Yeah. That's the thing which is hard to understand. That's right. One thing which somebody might now say is, okay, what went on then was an observation. Yeah. An observer came in with a conscious mind. That made the electron be in one place at a time. No, now, I'm not, not saying that's not right. It's not the observer, it's the interaction, which it's is right. a very different no, Right, no, I need I'm not saying that's right. Micro, but you can, macro, macro, if, this is a problem. Yeah. Put it this way, if somebody wants to find a role for, for mind in physical reality, if they already did, this would be exactly the place to look. It's, it, it's a, because right. it's a place where our intuition breaks down. Right, And, exactly. and there's a, it's a fertile there, field. There's a very important point that James just made. It's the interaction, he said. I totally disagree with that. It's not the interaction which does it, because interactions fit within the framework of quantum mechanics, and they lead to more weirdness. In order to get from that pool of weirdness a single actual observation of something, something has to suddenly radically change. It's not just interaction that does it, it's observation that does it. And Heisenberg made that point very clearly wow. a long time ago when he came up with his microscope and pointed out it's, it's observation that creates the path of an atom. But if you look at it in, in the, what, I, what I'm saying is if you look at it in the atomic world, I mean, the problems you run into are always from mixing metaphors by taking our Newtonian ideas and imposing them on, on the atomic world where they don't belong. If you look at it in the atomic world, it's an interaction of wave functions. That's what it is. John, yeah. from, uh, how do you see physicists sort of taking over or trying to take over what has traditionally been the, the sphere of philosophers? Well, I don't think this is the case of physicists trying to take over the sphere of philosophers. I think it's a, phys a physicist uh, uh, muscling in on a certain area of neurobiology. Uh, and the fact is, uh, uh, we know a lot about how the brain works. And there are, I mean, I, I work for something called the decade of the brain, uh, where you know, we actually try to uh, help people to work on figuring out how the brain works. Now, of course, we're at a stage where we welcome all speculations. But the idea that we're going to uh, uh, find consciousness at the level of uh, the, uh, the wave function in quantum mechanics is so far without any experimental support, whatever. There's a real difficulty with it, and that's this. As far as we know, consciousness exi exists only in human and animal brains, and they have very specific kind of anatomy. They have neurons. The problem with quantum mechanics is it's everywhere absolutely everywhere. Fred, you spent your entire career talking about the relationship of quantum mechanics and mind. Why should normal people care what you're talking about? For a very good reason. Today we live in a culture, a world, which has a view towards how things work. And unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, we have a very mechanical view of how things work. People who are born a certain way think of themselves possibly as victims for the rest of their lives because mechanically that's the way they are constructed. The quantum metaphor, the quantum story, changes all that. It says that observation affects, changes, alters reality. This means by changing the way you observe things, possibly you can change yourself. Greg, does this affect free will? Well, I don't really think so. Uh, it sounds actually more useful to a therapist than a, than a physicist. Somebody, somebody who needs a therapist? Yes. Uh, well, uh, uh, for people who need to think that by observing they can change their life, it, it probably is true, but uh, I don't think of experiments that way. Uh, to, to me, this uh, element of, say, trying to explain free will by quantum mechanics is a lot like playing tennis with the net down. Uh, looks interesting at first, but after a while, you know, loses its zip. Uh, and I don't think that's really the way to compound the, the levels of mystification and get some kind of actual predictive value out of an idea. It just seems to me to be worsening your problem, not bettering it. So you want to discard all the quantum mechanic discussions of the mind? No, but I want to say that you shouldn't ask quantum mechanics to solve philosophical problems, which it cannot do. And a philosopher can tell you why it won't. Uh, David, do <laughs> you think... It's an important issue for us as people, because this is an issue really about what we are. And we want to know what we are. Are we just souls, which get passed from you know, body to body or from body to afterlife down the generations? Are we bags of neurons, which rot when we die? Or does it turn out that we're actually comprised by a bunch of fundamental physical entities, maybe pr mental entities, which were around at the time of the Big Bang? 
I think that makes a huge difference to our, to our worldview and our view of our place in nature. And if the quantum physicist turned out to be right, that would make us reconceive our whole picture of ourselves. So it's potentially very important. That doesn't mean it's right. I think we should care about these issues because we want to know how the world works. <laughs> and the most fundamental uh, theory we have about how the world works is quantum mechanics. Now, we're tempted to think, well, that's going to explain a whole lot of other things. It's going to explain our problems in our personal life and our consciousness and free will. I'm very skeptical about all that. I don't think any of that's going to happen, but we would like to know how the world works. We'd like to know how we work. Jim? Yeah, I think uh, I would agree with that, that there's a, just a fundamental problem of we want to know who we are. I, I think that if the quantum mechanical metaphor helps people in their lives, as Fred was pointing out, then by all means use it. But don't try to pretend that it has anything to do with the quantum mechanics that's part of physics. You're saying like as, as a metaphorical clutch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, no, as, as an aid, as a help. If it helps you get through life, that's great. Uh, let's take a specific aspect of quantum mechanics called non-locality. Well, non-locality really means something that could happen over here that occurs because something that happens over there when there's no visible means by which something over there can affect something happening over here. So how did the here suddenly become what it is when the there over there changed when there was no visible connection between the two? And that, so that would be called non-locality. And that traditionally is called pseudoscience because that would seem to be impossible but in quantum mechanics we learn that it is possible. We well, learn that it's possible yeah. because the original objects had to interact and separate, and they formed what's called a single state. And because they, even though they were in separate parts, they were like in a, they were still in a single state. It's kind of like you've got two TV cameras on a great big fish bowl, and there's a fish swimming back and forth. One camera's watching the head, then the tail, then the head, then the tail. Another camera's watching the fish go forward and then backward and then forward and then backward. And if two television viewers are watching two television sets and are watching the fish, one would say, ah, there's a fish going backwards and forwards. And the other guy says, oh no, there's a head coming forward and going backwards. And they would say, there's two objects there. And a minute, but they're correlated. The minute the, the fish flips and turns to go backwards, the head flips and becomes a tail. So one would say, Jim, ah. How fishy is Fred's tail? Well, I, the basics are right. In fact, this is called uh, quantum entanglement. You, you start with two particles that are near each other. Uh, and when they separate, uh, they retain, if you like to think of it that way, a memory. Uh, and in fact, this is one of the more surprising uh, predictions of quantum mechanics. It uh, was verified experimentally in the 60s uh, to everyone's. It's the only time in science I can ever remember where you had a theory that everyone believed was true, make a prediction, uh, have the experiment verify the prediction, everybody was upset. <laughs> because what it, what it told us was you can't visualize what's going on at the quantum mm -hmm. world. You know, and we're primates. We deal in visual systems. And you can't draw a picture of an electron. And whenever you start using words and Newtonian imagery to describe... Newtonian describ to, meaning the normal... The normal. The whenever you, cause, cause every one of us, and I, I, I don't deny it, guys, you all think of these as little baseballs running around. Uh, you know, I do too. How it affects people's lives potentially is this word that we associate with Carl Jung called synchronicity. Mm -hmm. That things occur to people, and this, uh, many people have these experiences that seem irrationally, it, there's no reason why two mm -hmm. things occur together. Mm -hmm. And recently, uh, certain physicists and uh, uh, people involved in uh, uh, parapsychology have said that perhaps quantum mechanics is the underlying cause for these kinds of synchronicity. John, you're laughing at me. Well, <laughs> I mean, these, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the problem is that these kind of uh, odd um, coincidences that you get in real life are distinctly odd statistically, whereas quantum mechanics is pervasive. The, the kind of thing you're talking about is uh, the mother suddenly has an image of her son having a car accident. God, she finds out an hour later he did have a car accident. There must have been an explanation. Now, given that we have billions of conscious states in the course of our life, it's not to me at all surprising that you get these odd uh, correlations. But the idea that somehow or other, oh, well, that's just like quantum mechanics. It's not remotely like quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is an absolutely pervasive feature of the world at the most micro and fundamental level. So I don't see the connection between quantum mechanics and consciousness, nor do I see the uh, connection between quantum me mechanics and the kind of mystical phenomena that uh, seem to occur in daily life. I've never seen anybody make the connection. I think, I think to be fair with, uh, with John and with the rest of the panel, th one does have to stretch this. I, t I agree with you. I agree with you all on this. Quantum mechanics is not the 